Good evening, everybody. Would um, Katie or Katie, would you like to say something to begin? Thanks, Chandra. Um, shuffling some windows over here. It's a technological dashboard from from the side of things. So welcome everyone um, to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. We're thrilled that you're here and um, are here for this dive we're doing into the Lojong slogans. And I hope that any of you who've missed a class or two has been able to catch up on our YouTube channel. Um, so we have a special playlist just for the, this part of the class with the Lojong slogans. Um, and I'll toss the link in the chat in a minute so that if you, if you miss a class or if you want to kind of be fully present with the class, but then maybe take notes later, that's a resource that's available. Um, so please take advantage of that. And then I am going to, is Mace here? Um, if so, I'll, oh, Pam's here. Hey, Pam. Um, one thing that's coming up soon that I want to tell you all about is a friend of this class, uh, Tego Malley, is offering a, uh, I think it's a six week workshop on cultivating emotional balance that is specifically for the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and kicking off the workshop on September 6th on Sunday in this link, um, ah yeah, so no one's got the, no one's got the YouTube. Uh, in this link, there's going to be just an introduction to cultivating emotional balance, particularly for um, the LGBTQIA plus community. So if you or you have friends who are interested in learning more about cultivating emotional balance, this would be a great way to do it. Um, it's a drop-in free workshop um, on September 6th at this link. So just wanna let you know about that. And then as always, the collective is all volunteers and it's created in a connection with your Donna. So please do practice Donna if you can. Um, and we'll put those links in the chat too. And without further ado, Chandra, I'm so glad you're here. I can't wait to do whatever we're gonna do tonight. Thanks, Katie. What a great attitude. <laughs> um, I also pasted uh, my website in case anybody wants to see other things that I'm doing. Uh, you're always welcome to, to join in in other areas too and get on my newsletter list there if you'd like. So that's exciting about CEB, Cultivating Emotional Balance with Teague for, for the community. And I love the technique, very much uh, a big influence on me <clears throat> and Eve is Alan's work, Alan Wallace's work with Cultivating Emotional Balance. His innovative approaches to shamatha very much based in in the sutras and traditional teachings, but the way that he interprets it is so accessible and inspiring. Even now, after 20 years, I go back and listen to his podcasts <clears throat> and his instructions on shamatha. And he's the one who taught me the settling the mind in its natural state practice that we've been doing regularly here. And uh, I'm sure it's integrated in the cultivating emotional balance curriculum as well as wonderful techniques that Eve and her father, Paul Ekman, developed alongside Alan. So I very much encourage you to explore that with Teague. Thank you, SFDC, for hosting such great events. And it's a ple pleasure to be here with you all on our, I think it's our fourth class with the Lojong slogans, if I'm not mistaken. Eve took you beautifully through a couple slogans last week and we'll keep going tonight. And before we do, I want to guide you through practice. And the plan for tonight is we'll do two practice sessions. The first one will be on shamatha, namely, we'll begin with breath awareness and then we'll move into settling the mind in its natural state, this awareness of the mind and the contents of the mind, taking it as our object. And then we'll talk a bit about the slogans and the uh, Donglen practice will be introduced tonight. And then we'll do another session with Donglen meditation so you can really feel it. So two meditative sessions uh, for the length of Gatikas, which is a 24 minute segment of time. It's said in the Kala Chakra Tantra, as well as in Chinese medical texts that 
24 minutes is the length of time it takes for the prana, the energy, to cycle through the body one complete time. It's a very good length of time to do a practice of meditation, yoga, practice piano, <laughs> write. You could really do anything within 24 minutes. A segment of time, it's not too long, not too short. So we'll do two gatikas tonight, not back to back. We'll do 24 with shamatha then 24 with Donglen. So we'll have a nice little longer practice than normal tonight. So let's go ahead and drop in. Take a comfortable position so that you feel you can relax. Enjoy the benefits of meditation. If you like, you can turn off your screen or leave it on. You can turn parallel to the screen. You can close your eyes or leave them open. It's up to you. As we settle in, take some deep breaths, releasing tension with the out breath. Feel yourself settling into the present moment with the breath in the body before any technique or any thinking really towards efforting and, and meditation just enjoy the simple feeling of being being in the moment right now quality of presence that imbues this moment to moment awareness it's quite simple it's a feeling of loosening up and unraveling the constrictions the tensions that we hold within our body within the mind releasing tension with each out breath Feeling the spine nice and straight, aligned with gravity, at ease within itself. The chin slightly drawn in towards the center of the throat. The tip of the tongue resting against the upper palate. Jaw relaxed. The eyes either closed or slightly open, gazing gently past the level of the nose, as you prefer, is fine. The arms relax, the hands on your thighs or in your lap. The belly soft and the legs at ease, the hips relaxed. The feet nice and grounded on the earth if you're in a chair or the hips nice and grounded if you're on a cushion. Feel the earth beneath you and draw from that resource of the earth the support, the stability. And feel the qualities of the earth element within you echoing the bones, the quietude, the stillness. And from the heart, not the head, from the heart space, draw forth a heartfelt wish, aspiration for your life and for your practice, for the world. This bodhicitta, the spirit of awakening for the benefit of others and yourself.
And let the breath draw you more deeply into meditation, releasing any thoughts or aspirations. Now again, returning to the present moment. And the first ingredient to a meditation practice is relaxation. Release tension with each breath. Feel the muscles of the body softening, more space, more ease, each breath soothing you into a state of relaxation. And from that place of relaxation then Introducing a gentle touch of stability, like a pinch of stability, like a pinch of salt into your shamatha soup. It's a little stability without losing the quality of relaxation. And we do that by threading the breath. The thread is mindfulness. Each breath is the pearl. Thread the pearl of each breath. Stay present and relaxed. If it helps to count to bring a little more stability to the active mind, and just a simple count internally at the top of each in-breath. Releasing with the out-breath, softening, yet being present through the whole round of the breath. The top of the next in-breath, another count, counting one to ten. Perhaps one, two, or three times through. As we cultivate the quality of stability within relaxation. Releasing distraction with the out-breath, stay with the counting and the breath, infused with relaxation, simple, simply stay, <clears throat> subtle sensations of the in and the out-breath, the mind wanders, gently release and come back again and again.
Now releasing the counting, but stay present, mindful of the breath in the body. Feel that awareness broaden, that wakefulness ever present. And now shifting into settling the mind in its natural state through Gently opening the eyes, letting them rest at a comfortable angle, downcast and soft, without staring at anything in particular. Soften the gaze, soften the muscles behind the eyes. And now shifting the object of shamatha from that of the breath to that of the mind, the space of the mind and whatever arises within that space becomes the object of our shamatha practice in settling the mind in its natural state. The feeling is like you could see the space of the mind within the space between you and the floor, the wall. But don't stare, it's very soft and it's a space that's neither internal nor external, it just is, the space of the mind, your awareness. This practice is also known as shamatha focused on the mind or taking the mind as the path. Also taking the mind and appearances as the path. These are all different names for this practice of shamatha with the space of the mind as the object. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, ruminations will arise within the space. And yet those appearances don't change the fundamental nature of the space itself. In a sense, we're developing a metacognitive awareness of whatever arises in the mind. It's like becoming lucid in a dream. In a non-lucid dream, you are caught up with and fused with all the thoughts and appearances that arise within the mind. In a lucid dream, it's the opposite. In a lucid dream, this this distinction between awareness of the dream and the appearances that arise. The emotions, the thoughts, and so on. You're aware of them, but not cognitively fused with them. Because you are not fully identified with them. So in this practice, it's like we're becoming lucid within our life, the waking dream. Rest in the vantage point of awareness rather than the vantage point fused with thought. Release grasping, release distraction. And return to the present moment. The breath can be a small anchor 
a little bit off to the side, it's always there. But the main anchor, the main object of your awareness is the domain of the mind itself. without preferring or rejecting, just witnessing, observing the appearances of the mind like you're observing a play on a stage. Release the cognitive fusion with the out-breath and rest in that open spacious awareness. If you find the mind is lost in rumination, excitation, then relax, release, and then return to the present moment, observing the space of the mind and whatever arises in it. On the other hand, if you feel dull, if laxity is setting in, a heaviness is spacing out, then refresh, restore, and retain mindfulness focused on the space of the mind and whatever arises in it. With introspection, maintain the flow of mindfulness alert to the occurrence of laxity, dullness, spacing out.
Hello, Mamani Pami Hong, let's come back. That was our first Gatika for the evening, a 24 minute segment of time. We'll do another one with the Donglen. I thought it would be nice to invite you to. Uh, Katie, if the chat's not open, if we could open it, and I'd love to hear from people, um, see your faces if you can turn your videos on, and um, chat in, you know, your name, where you're zooming in from, and a word or two or three about what you found in that space of the mind. <laughs> One to three words, you know, not like a, a long thing, just quick, uh, what did you find? What did you not find? It's a way to greet each other and cultivate community here. Michael Chicago found an awake dream state. Very good. Okay, stillness from Pamela, who I know is an SF. <laughs> Katie zooming in from Massachusetts found a soft, diffuse space. Noam SF loved the idea of stringing breaths together like pearls strung on the string of mindfulness. Yes. Peace from Susan in Venice. Serenity from Tonya in Berkeley. Hey, Berkeley. Lily in SF. Irritation, that's welcome here too. Not preferring, not pushing away, right, Lily? <laughs> Balance, deep, relaxed space. Peace, the first time since fires. Good, Deborah. The urge to plan, yes. Thank you for your honesty, Donna. From LA. Joe in Oakland exploring somewhere between internal and external. Dimitra, relaxation from Milwaukee. Eric in Seattle found an irritability that recorded, that receded gradually. That's nice. Impermanence. Young, everyone. Annette held together. Very comfortable. Erica, thank you. Diane from San Jose, presence, hereness, openness. Marina Los Altos, open to the channels, to stuck channels and shoulder, good. Jumping from awake to dream to restlessness, yes. Do you feel, good, Paul from New Jersey, open space. Do you feel that you can <clears throat> rest from the vantage point of spacious awareness instead of always being infused with thought? Did that resonate with you? And and isn't it? How did that? How does that feel? Resting in the van from the vantage point of thought rather than from the vantage point resting from the vantage point of awareness rather than the vantage point of thought. Yeah, I didn't know if you were awake or or not. Strange liminal space, perhaps. We can have all sorts of nyam meditative experiences called nyam, which are signs that the pranas are shifting and settling, the perception is purifying. And sometimes those nyam can be weird, like I'm in between space, it's liminal, I don't know, am I awake or asleep? Am I 10 feet tall or am I two inches tall? Sometimes you can feel you're all on one side. Has anybody ever felt that, that you're probably, that you feel lopsided? All sorts of interesting things can be, you can yawn a lot, cry, laugh, scream. <laughs> There's a long list in the Vajra Essence, a classic Dzogchen test of, text of all the, the nyam that can arise. And if you were to just read that, you'd be like, I don't know if I want to start meditating. <laughs> There's some pretty funny things in there. But what it says is that it's not all love me light, right? It's not always easy. And as we dredge the depths of our psyches, sometimes we pull up some pretty scary looking, you know, deep water monsters. So don't reify those. Don't cling on to them. Don't think, oh God, that's really who I am. Oh my God, what have I found here? Just see that's a part of me. Maybe that's just a part. It's not all of me. Good. Useful and not getting caught in emotions of the moment. Good, good. That's called liberation, one step at a time.
clarity. Thank you, everybody. So the breath is like, um, a, a few weeks ago, I might have used this analogy in this class, which is, you know, in the beginning, I always like, and this is how I've learned from my teachers, to start with a spacious, relaxed style of breath awareness so that we can come down for a landing, drop in, relax, release the activity of the day, come home to the body and the breath. You may only need a few breaths to do that, or you might need many you can count from one to ten if the counting helps you. Counting is like training wheels, but you don't need to use the counting all the time. Or some people find it's a little too much mental activity. So if it doesn't work for you, don't worry about it. You don't need to do it. Some people find it helps to bring a focus. I find it helps me because I'm a daydreamer. I like to dream. <laughs> so for me, the counting was very helpful. It still is but I don't need it all the time. So depending on how your day was, what you ate, you know, your level, your experience with meditation, counting might be good at times, it might not be good at times. Then when we release the counting and we let the breath recede into the background, we shift into settling the mind in its natural state so the domain of the mind becomes the foreground. And then all those interesting deep sea creatures that arise within the ocean of the mind, right? Some glow in the dark, some are big, some are small, some are scary, some are interesting. Yeah. And one nice analogy is that the, the, you can have one hand on the buoy of the breath while you put your goggles on and you look into the depths of the domain of the mind. But the, the hand is always there on this nice rising and falling of the breath. Sometimes if you get too far out there, like for example with um, music, Michael, <laughs> um, you know, if you feel that you're just getting too dull or you're kind of dreaming, then come back to the breath and get a little more clarity. A little more clarity. So introspection is the faculty of mind that from time to time comes in and says, how am I doing? Oh, I've drifted off. Time to come back. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, I'm too agitated. I'm really tight. I'm getting a headache. Relax. Release and return to the breath. So introspection is a little bit like the quality control. It's not all of your mindfulness. Some people say, teachers will say it's like 15% of your uh, awareness is like a little introspection, 15%. And then the other 85% is mindfulness. So the introspection just comes in and says, oh, you've drifted, come back. Very simple, light touch. The two pitfalls, the classic pitfalls in developing meditative concentration, samadhi, especially within this context of shamatha, calm abiding, is... On the one hand, the pitfall can be excitation, rumination. A couple of weeks ago, I brought up this word vikalpa, which means rumination, this active mind. So that's one pitfall. That's one thing to watch out for is this agitated. The Tibetan word is gupa, agitated thinking mind. When that's happening, what do we do? mentioned it in the meditation. You could even write this down if you're taking notes. When the mind is active and agitated, there are the three R's of relax, release, that fixation, and then return to the object of mindfulness, whether it's the breath or the domain of the mind or a mantra or a visualization. The other pitfall is a sinking feeling, dullness. It's called gupa. I mean, jingwa. Jingwa. It's a pretty cool word, huh? Say it. You could say it. Jingwa. Jingwa. <laughs> kind of feels like jingwa. I'm sinking. I'm jinging. That's laxity, dullness. That's the other pitfall of shamatha. So when, you, when introspection comes in and says, oh, ding dong, you're sinking again, 
The other three R's that you can use for Jinghua is refresh. So you can sit up a little straighter, maybe. Maybe you've slouched and take a deep breath and liven the inner body. I like to feel that I'm turning up the dial of kind of brightening my light, inner light. So refresh, then restore, meaning come back and restore your stability and your clarity, and then retain the mindfulness on the object. So if you're sinking into dullness, refresh, restore, and retain mindfulness. Focused on the space of the mind, for example, in this practice of settling the mind in its natural state. Those are things that as, as experienced meditators, we can, we can keep in mind so that we can navigate those waters and know what to do. So that we can start to enjoy more stability, relaxation, and clarity within our meditative practice. And that's very enjoyable. When, when things start to flow and you're no longer just kind of like buffeted by the winds of your erratic vikalpa <laughs> ruminations, there's a very wonderful feeling that comes from that. It's worth the effort, yeah? And then from that space, we can cultivate the next aspect of Buddhist practice, which is vipassana, or in Pali, it's vipassana. In Sanskrit, it's vipassana, S-H-Y-A-N-A. And that is insight into the impermanent, empty nature of thought, feeling, self, appearances. And what Alan Wallace says is that this practice of settling the mind in its natural state is right on the cusp of shamatha and vipassana. Because we're, we can go all the way with this practice and develop the final stages of shamatha, total dissolution of the surface mind into the alaya. Remember, you talked about the alaya last week. The storehouse consciousness, the base, the ground consciousness, the essential nature of mind, and that's shamatha. And then also, though, through this practice of observing the space of the mind and those appearances, the arisings within the mind, you see the ever-flowing empty nature of thoughts because you see they kind of arise, they bubble around for a while, and then they dissolve. There's no real intrinsic thingness that you can grasp onto. Even the sense of I, even the sound of a bell, you start to see the dreamlike illusory nature, right? Of thoughts, impressions, feelings, ideas, plans, judgments, hope and fear. And that is a natural experience of vipassana. That's what vipassana is, seeing into the empty dreamlike nature of phenomena. Vipassana is the insight into the nature of reality, which is shunyata, emptiness. So this is what we've been steeping in with these first slogans, right? This, these absolute bodhicitta slogans. What is emptiness? What is it? Why are appearances dreamlike? And then, and then, like when we understand emptiness, right? Like in the third slogan, examine the nature of unborn awareness, that resting in that awareness, free of grasping and distraction and clinging and so reification is a common word used in Dharma. Not reifying thoughts is something solid. Then you have a natural experience of the way things truly are. And that experience of how things truly are is what we then let go of in the next slogan, right? The fourth slogan is self-liberate even the antidote. Remember that? I kind of hinted to it and then uh, I didn't have time to fully unpack it. So I want to touch on that right now. So self-liberate even the antidote. What does that mean? Such a funny word, so, a phrase. So... 
What it's referring to is the contemplations of the prior slogans, meaning emptiness. So the antidote that they're talking about here in this slogan number four, self-liberate even the antidote, the antidote is the realization that our discursive thoughts have no intrinsic reality, that there's no real origin, location, or destination to all of our thoughts, these discursive thoughts. They appear, yet they're like a rainbow in the sky. You can't find them anywhere. So the antidote that they're talking about is that, oh, that realization of, oh my God, everything is empty of intrinsic existence. It's amazing. And it is like medicine. It's the antidote to all of our ills, right? Because when we grasp and reify, I'm this, I'm that, we suffer. The ego fixation causes us to suffer. So we see that thoughts aren't solid things. And this is so important for dissolving our self-clinging, our sense of loneliness, our taking ourselves too seriously. Humor starts to come into your life more. So an ex it's an experience of this emptiness, this shunyata, that is the antidote. But now we have this slogan, liberate that, self-liberate or naturally liberate that. So that means that we have to go beyond this experience of emptiness. Because that experience of shunyata or emptiness can slide into a mistaken view that nothing really matters. So there's a danger there. That you could slide into a kind of nihilism. Oh, it's all empty, it's all illusory, who cares? Why don't I just go out and rob a bank? It's illusory, money and bank and... This is what they call the poison of shunyata. So you know how a medicine can be also a poison and vice versa, right? So they're saying don't go too far with shunyata because it can get poisonous. So the other way of saying that is if we make emptiness a thing, then we miss the point. So emptiness is a quality of experience, like wetness is to water. It's not a thing, and so we shouldn't reify it. Label it emptiness. It's a thing. Put it up on a billboard and bow down to it. No, don't do that. Shunya means empty. Ness is, ta means ness. Shunya ta is empty ness. It's a qualifier. It's a quality of reality. Like wetness is a quality of water. So this antidote is analysis, right? We're looking into the nature, it's not there. Okay, it's this an analytical. Yes, it's, it's experiential as well. But the antidote is analysis. But at a certain point, we need to drop it. Drop the analysis. Drop what we were doing in the previous two slogans of seeing into the empty dreamlike nature of outer reality and inner reality. So Lojong says that analysis, even this shunyata, which is so profound and beautiful and the subject of all these wonderful sutras, the Heart Sutra, the Prajnaparamita Sutras, and so on, but even emptiness has no reality of its own. So don't reify that. But what do we do? We simply need to let go of whatever answer we come up with in meditation, with vipassana, for example, looking into the nature of reality, insight. We let go of whatever answer we find there in meditation, and we rest the mind in its natural state, like what we've been doing. You learn to rest and observe, but not chase after, you just rest in that luminosity and that clarity, that wakefulness. The great <clears throat> Jamgun Kongtrul says in his path, the great path of awakening, 
real classic Lojong text. I can paste this in the, uh, in the chat for you too, but he says, I'll paste it. So he says, when we look at the presence of the remedy itself, these thoughts about the absence of true existence, there is nothing for the mind to refer to, and they subside naturally on their own. Yes, that's how they naturally liberate. Uh, the word is rang drol. Rang is self or natural. Drol is to liberate. So it's this natural unraveling. The, the, the image is like that of a snake who's wrapped up around itself in knots. All it has to do is relax in order to unravel. That's like the mind. We're all, we're all kind of wrapped up around ourselves in these illusory contorted knots. <laughs> and if we could just release, then the mind will naturally find its balance again. It's so beautiful. It's classic text on these teachings of Dzogchen. This is so Dzogchen too. It's Lojong, but it's also Dzogchen, Great Perfection Teachings. One of the greatest classics, which you should read. But even if you never read it, just the title is good enough because it's called Buddhahood Without Meditation. <laughs> Do you understand? As long as we're trying to meditate, we're meditating, then we're missing the whole point. We'll never achieve Buddhahood because we're stuck in this thing of like, I have to meditate. The rangdrol is a natural liberation of non-doing. It's liberation with non-doing. into, And then we fall into the beautiful feather bed of our natural state. <laughs> And on the path of Dzogchen, they say the path gets easier and easier. All the practices that we do, they get simpler and simpler. As we progress, we get older. Doesn't that sound good? As we get older, we don't want to get more complicated. No. We've earned it, right? We've earned the relaxation, the ease. I'll tell you, I just completed a 10-year practice program with Tara Mandala where we did the classical curriculum you would find in a three-year, three-month retreat spread out over 10 years for the lay practitioner. And the beginning is like the prostrations, the 100,000 of this, the 100,000 of that, the mantra recitations, the prayers. It's a lot of beautiful, but it's work. There's also resting and meditating and all of that too. Then there's the yogas and the deity yogas and the Tibetan, like Trokor, the Tibetan yogas. Of, it's like Hatha yoga. Then there's some other really cool stuff that you're starting to do that really helps to dismantle the ego fixation called Rushen. And then you get into the last phases and it's just so simple. And the, the Rinpoche that, who taught us these practices said now it's getting simpler as you progress along the path it should be that way you've kind of done your hard work while you were younger now as you get older you get to relax so this practice is like that it's like going it's the pinnacle dzogchen great perfection it's the ati yoga the pinnacle yoga so you're there you have the good karmas to meet this now even some of you are quite young So we have this natural liberation of even the remedy. Don't reify the remedy. The great Siddha from India, Saraha, said that those who believe that everything is solid and real are stupid like cattle. But that those who believe that everything is empty are even more stupid. <laughs> So we always want to pin things down, fix them. 
So whenever you've reached a solid conclusion, let the rug be pulled out from under you. Better yet, pull it out from under yourself. Just let it go. Lighten up, be more gentle. Don't make such a big deal out of things. As my teacher Lama Tsultram says, let go and let Tara. Tara is the female Buddha of compassion, this beautiful, great mother. Let go and then let Tara. Just let her take care of you. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so that was the little commentary on self-liberate, even the antidote that I had wanted to give two weeks ago and I never gave. So now we're going to hop forward, right? Because Eve had a lovely class last week where she moved on and did the, um, the rest in the, the uh, nature of Alaya, the essence, right? Some of you were there, if not all of you. <clears throat> So again, another absolute bodhicitta slogan where you're resting in the natural state. Alaya is that ground, um, ground consciousness. It's called the Alaya Vignana, or the greatest ground consciousness of all. It's the natural state. And I think Eve taught beautifully on that last week, so I won't go into that. And then she touched on the next slogan, number six, in post-meditation, be a child of illusion, right? She touched it lightly, so I'm going to go into it now. This is so beautiful. And remember in the meditation I said, um, we're developing this metacognition where you can become lucid in the waking dream. That is what we mean here by when you get off your cushion, be, stay awake in this waking dream. Don't fall asleep. Don't go numb. Be a child of illusion means see the empty, luminous, beautiful, bizarre, tragic comedy of this dreamlike nature of our life and hold it lightly like a child. Have a sense of play and openness we can maintain that as we get older. We will and have a you know wonderful life. There's nothing worse than getting too rigid and tight as we get older. We have to f struggle against that. <laughs> Stay playful. Laugh. Find ways to have fun and to enjoy yourself. Music, dance, singing, jokes. Sometimes I like to watch comedy, you know, I'll turn on Trevor Noah or something like that when I feel like I need to lighten up. Find your thing that makes you feel that you can laugh and enjoy. So in post-meditation, be a child of illusion. So this is the last slogan in this kind of category of absolute bodhicitta. After this, we'll go into Tonglen which is, should happen in a few minutes. <laughs> so this be a child of illusion is just what it seems. It's have a playful sense of not holding things too solidly, especially when we get up from the cushion. Don't go back into your kind of knee-jerk or dualistic, solidified way of reacting to the world. See if while you're in the world, you can say, oh, remember, be a child of illusion. What does that mean to me? How does that feel to me? Connect with the environment. Connect with your breath. See something you didn't notice. Notice the quality of your experience. It's not all as solid as it seems. This helps us to keep the point of view of the Buddha, right? See the world through the Buddha's eyes. You could ask that of yourself. What would it look like? What would the world look like? What would this person look like to me if I was seeing the world through the eyes of a Buddha? How would that feel? So also the child of illusion refers to having beginner's mind. 
an open innocence, a sense of wonder. Like a hologram, the world is vivid yet empty. So that concludes our absolute bodhicitta portion of the slogans. Uh, slogans two through six are absolute level, right? Slogan one was the foundations, train in the preliminaries. Slogans two through six were all about absolute truth, emptiness, dreamlike nature, the nature of mind. Now we're going into relative bodhicitta. And the next slogan is the seventh one, train in taking and sending alternately. These two should ride the breath. This is the slogan. Train in taking and sending, meaning Tonglen, alternately. These two should ride the breath. So now we're getting instruction on how to practice. And now that we understand ultimate bodhicitta, we're more ready to effectively practice Tonglen. We understand the interdependent, empty nature of all of us. And through that, we can cultivate a deeper sense of compassion. Because we're interconnected, we're not separate. So it's important to have the spaciousness that we get through the Absolute Bodhicitta slogans so that we can meet whatever it is we meet with the Lojong, with the Tonglen. So we find that there's more room within the heart space. There's more capacity to meet the challenge, the pain, perhaps the suffering that we meet with the Tonglen intentionally. Normally we shield our heart, right? But with the Lojong, we learn to ventilate and open, aerate the space of the heart. Tong means to send, Len means to receive. I'll explain a little bit about the arc of it and then I'll guide you in it. So there are really classically taught four main stages of Donglen. This is popularized by Pema Chodron and um, her teacher, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. There are many different ways to practice. This one is quite popular and I like it a lot. It's what I've used many years now. The four stages of Donglen are first flashing on that absolute bodhicitta, recalling that open, spacious ground of being that you've connected with. She calls it flashing on openness. It's like a, a flash of absolute bodhicitta, resting in the nature of the alaya, the ground. That's the first. And then the second is to actually practice breathing like a pranayama, Breathing in and out, aware of the breath, and linking it with some texture, meaning that the in-breath is connected with a dark, smoky texture, and the out-breath is connected with a clear, cool, light texture. The inhale, a dark, smoky texture. Exhale, cool, light texture. So because that's what we're going to be doing, we'll be breathing in the suffering, the fixation, the density through the dark, smoky vapor. And then we breathe out a clear, cool remedy, the cooling, healing remedy with the out-breath. And when we're breathing, we're imagining we're breathing through full 360 degrees into, into and out of the heart space directly. That's the texture, that was the second part. The third part is to work with a specific heartfelt object. So that might be yourself, it might be a friend, a loved one, it might be a, an enemy, it might be a neutral person. We can work through the progression of friend or self, friend, neutral and enemy, that's the classic progression. Or you can just flash right away onto whoever, whomever you wanna work with. So that's the third aspect, a heartfelt object. And then the fourth and final is opening that to universal suffering and working with that with the breath. 
So the idea is that normally that which we resist persists. So with the Donglen, much like in Feeding Your Demons, we're turning towards that, we would, that which we would normally push away. And we're offering that which we would normally keep to ourselves, for ourselves. So let's go ahead and try. Let's have the experience. I know I've talked a lot. And so now let's drop in and you can take a comfortable seat or even lie down and be guided through that. This experience on a supine position is absolutely good and welcome if you've had a long day. Most important thing is to be comfortable and to have the spine in a nice straight position, whether you're upright or supine. Allow the eyes to close and settle in. Feel that wonder and the openness of transitioning from the land of the absolute bodhicitta into the wonderful, skillful means, the upaya of the donglen, helping us to open to relative level bodhicitta. The two ultimately aren't separate or different. It's like two sides of the same coin. In fact, absolute bodhicitta suffuses everything. And the natural expression of absolute bodhicitta is love and compassion. And so now let's drop in. And this first step of the Donglen is to flash on openness, flash on emptiness. And then from that space, we begin to focus on the breath. Before you notice the texture of the in and the out breath, I like to take a moment and feel in my heart space, the center of the heart, the chakra, the heart center is an orb of luminous, radiant light. This symbolizes your bodhicitta, this awakened nature which is indestructible, luminous, radiating this potent quality of presence and love and compassion. It might be a small feeling, it might be full in the heart, it's up to you, this orb of light, your bodhicitta. And all exhaling together with an out breath. And then let's all draw an in breath together, imagining with the in breath that you're drawing in a dark, smoky vapor directly into that orb of light at your heart where it evaporates. It's purified. And with the out breath, breathing out the cool, clear, luminous light. Again, working with texture, breathing in a dark, smoky vapor. where it evaporates upon the s- touching the sunlight at the heart and then exhale, that rays of the sun naturally emanate out, cool remedy of clear healing light. Stay like this, we'll do about five more breaths, working with the texture.
Now introducing the third step of working with a heartfelt object. I'll let you choose tonight. You can either work with yourself or a loved one, a neutral person or a so-called enemy. If you're working with yourself, you simply breathe in and out of the heart space, whatever you're working with, whatever challenge you have. If you're working with a, another person, then imagine them in front of you as clearly as you can. Perhaps remembering how they looked the last time you saw them. Who would you like to work with tonight? Who needs some care, some attention, some prayer? Who has been suffering? Maybe someone you know, it may be a stranger. See them as clearly as you can in front of you. And then see that like you, they wish to be free of suffering and yet they are suffering. And see that suffering surrounding them in the form of a dark, smoky cloud. And with the in-breath, imagine that you're drawing their suffering into the heart space, dark, smoky texture, where it becomes illuminated, purified, transformed at the heart space. And breathing out a cool breeze, a clearing, a healing remedy of whatever their suffering may be. Offering that to them with the out breath. Taking in the suffering where it becomes liberated, a natural liberation, the luminosity at your heart. And breathe out a remedy in the form of a cool, clear, healing light. Like an out-breath, a breeze clearing that smoky suffering around them. Continue like this, breathing in and out. Breathing in the disease, the illness, the pain, the confusion. Breathing out the remedy whatever intuitively you feel might help them, but let go of any attachment to the outcome. You're doing this in the, from the view of absolute bodhicitta. No clinging, no reification. Practice in silence.
If you wish, you can bring to mind another person. Spend some time breathing in and out, being willing to take on metaphorically in this prayer contemplative space, the suffering of the other, drawing it into that luminous orb of light of bodhicitta at your heart and breathing out love, compassion, any antidote, remedy that you may feel could help and release that antidote, let it go. Offer to them freely without expect of reward or appreciation. You can even bring to mind any metta phrases that you like. May you be well. May you be free of suffering. May you have peace and safety. Whatever comes to mind, offer it with the out-breath. And draw in the dark smoky vapor of their ailment with the in-breath. Stay with the texture aerating this heart space, this heart space, you, you and your bodhicitta are indestructible, you cannot be harmed by this. In fact, this may do you more good than anyone else out there. Feel that, find that for yourself, find that natural liberation. Release the struggle. Now the fourth and final stage of the universal suffering, imagining uh, the whole world with its myriad of experiences and hot spots and areas of pain. Even alone in this country itself, we can feel overwhelmed by it all. One beautiful instruction I received from Pema Chodron was to imagine that you are up on the moon, looking down upon the earth. And that with the in-breath, you draw in that dark, smoky vapor of pain, suffering, and then breathe it into your heart. Transform it at that luminous orb of light at your heart. And send out a cool, clear, cosmic breeze of healing and healing. Cool, healing light surrounding the earth, cooling the flames of the fires burning 
the pain, the anger, the confusion, the corruption. The inhale, draw that in. Transform it at your bodhisattva heart, the heart of courage. And breathing out a cool, clear, healing light. Continue like this. Be specific here. You can bring to mind issues, groups of people who need a prayer, perhaps. May those who are oppressed be free of oppression and suffering. May those who oppress be free of the delusion that causes that oppression and violence. Make your own personal prayer in these last few moments. I practice Tonglen with 150% of dedication and the sincere wish that suffering be alleviated. Yes, of course, that is our aspiration. And yet we can also hold that in the midst of a letting go and a letting Tara, a letting go and a deep recognition that like an arrow, once we release the prayer, we have no control. We let go, we release it. And we continue to breathe. And we recommit it to our aspiration to be kind in speech, kind in thought, and kind in action. And we close our session tonight with a prayer of dedication. May this energy, this positive energy we've cultivated tonight be of benefit in the world vast as the ocean, and in this moment of offering it becomes limitless. Thank you. 
So that was our official deep dive into Tonglen. We will continue to practice Tonglen in the coming weeks now. The Shamatha Tonglen will be our primary bread and butter of our meditative practices. Of course, enhanced with other explorations as well. So I would love to remind you that our Sangha is completely donation-based. The volunteers, the board, everyone who helps run the 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 events here are all doing it by volunteer basis as well as the teachers and so on so any generosity you can offer to the san francisco dharma collected is very very much uh, appreciated we create tendril and auspicious interconnection through the giving and the receiving the reciprocal relationship and classically the dharma would be uh, received uh, and um, appreciated through the show of some kind of support. So it's important to have that, even if it's just a dollar or if it's a million dollars, anything in between. <laughs> and I'm sure that the um, the link to Donna is posted there for you all, so it makes it easy. And I am here in sincere gratitude for everybody who runs this show. Thank you, everybody, and for you for showing up and practicing. Together we are stronger. So may it be so. Continue throughout the week, and we'll see you again next week. Take care, everybody. Lots of love. Upcoming events at the Collective are posted there as well. All of this stuff is in the chat. Thanks, you guys. Good night, everybody. You can unmute if you want to say good goodbye. I'll stay on for another minute or so. Thank Hear you. Your voices is nice. You're welcome. Thanks. Good night. You're welcome. Peace. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good yeah. Thank you. Good You're so much better. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.